Guys, the, the title is a bit um, dramatic, should we say. But um, the fact is, David mentioned already, all the rules have changed. Uh, we're now going through a crisis that already has, and for the foreseeable future, is going to continue to fundam fundamentally change how we do business. If your business attempts to return to the old ways, you're going to find that you're rapidly outmatched and outpaced by organizations with a strong digital strategy. That's why when this title says doing nothing now is a spectacularly bad idea. So I'm going to give you a few minutes intro into kind of what we see as important and how we do that. Um, and my colleague, Abdi, is going to give you a little demonstration at the end of it. So let's get straight in and basically take a look at the new landscape and the impact of COVID on IT groups. So before this crisis, around 5% of the workforce was working remotely. And in 2020, that's projected to rise to about 50%. It was already at 30% in June when I delivered a presentation on this, uh, but projected to rise to 50. So that means that any service management challenge you've had prior to the crisis have just been amplified tenfold. So the estimated cost for the global economy in 2020 is somewhere between six and nine trillion dollars. That's transformative numbers. Analyst groups and leading groups and economists are struggling to predict what the, the impact will be on economy sectors and firms, but they all agree on the way forward. And that's that technology has to pave the path out of COVID. Recognizing that their businesses work faster than they ever thought possible just six or seven months ago, executives won't want to go back to the old world. They're going to call upon technology and the people that support it to eliminate waste and develop a, a, a competitive edge in the new economy. So along with my colleague, Nigel Martin, we collated guidance from the top tier analyst groups and we combined that with their own experience in the ITSM market to help plot this path of the COVID. In July, I delivered that keynote um, at the virtual SIT summit. And at the end of the presentation, I'll provide you with links to the webinar and to the slides from that. So the paper includes this journey map, which highlights five stages that IT organizations are gonna go through on that path to recovery. So stage one, that's behind us now, and IT groups are either going or have already gone through stage two. But as we enter stage three and beyond, the ability for our customers to self-serve, coupled with our ability to automate those service management processes, and not just for IT, but right across the enterprise is going to be the difference between surviving and thriving. The old ways that we were used to, big projects, implementation partners, technical gurus, that's far too slow and expensive. And as we enter this new normal, IT and other service delivery teams are going to have to be self-sufficient with the ability to design and adapt business processes at speed as conditions continue to change. So if you're not there yet, you still have time, but you need to be aware that other teams with a strong digital strategy are way ahead of you. The crisis has redefined what our businesses expect from technology and from the people who support it. So if you think that things are going to return to normal, I encourage you to think again. This is your wake-up call. I believe that history is going to record this as a time when the way we work and the way we use business technology were changed forever. So for at least the next 12 months, we're stuck in the current situation. And the case now for investing in the right technology is crystal clear because without it, your transformation strategy is dead in the water. So we track uh, intent data across the market, basically what people are searching for. And we track that across ITSM terms in real time globally about, about across about 5 billion data points. And as we gather that information, it highlights that as a profession, we have far bigger concerns than things like ITSM metrics. They don't feature in these search terms. Our businesses won't stand back and watch us water our IT gardens while the rest of the house is on fire. So be under no illusion about just how important business process design and automation have become. So what are the important things that people are searching for and investing in? Well, the feedback we got from the market feeds that thought leadership and also our product strategy discussions. So the previous cycle of implementing a new tool and failing to continually improve it, then replacing with another one every five years, that's no longer acceptable. Now we need to get really serious about self-service, business process design, automation, integration, and enterprise service management. And to drive that, user adoption is going to be paramount. So the tools we deliver must uh, reach in terms of ease of use, but also in terms of user experience. So we also get fantastic insight from our customers. And so in 2020, we surveyed 100% of our customer base to ensure that we were kind of aligning with their direction to three 
three key questions. And those questions are what challenges are they facing in the next 12 months? How can we support you and what can we do to excel? So what we have also is uh, we know what the market's looking for. We also know what our customers need. And that all plays out in a really highly active and vibrant Hornbill community. So that links our customers, not only directly with all of our resources, but it also links all of our customers together. And we get a really good sense of what the community is actually looking for. But as a result, it allows us to keep a really simple product strategy. And that's to create the latest innovations that the market needs, put them in the hands of our customers, and continually improve and iterate based on their feedback. So what that means is that basically we have a clear purpose, just basically designing home builds to make life at work better. And what we set out to do, and I think what we have done, is removed all the frustrations and limitations that prevent IT groups from innovating. So that includes things like 100% codeless, no code at all, out-of-the-box workflows that are really simple to configure with powerful process design and automation. And literally, we can have it up and running weeks at a fraction of the cost, and there's no compromise on, on functionality. So as we enter this new kind of era, self-sufficiency is going to be really, really important. And you need to be able to respond to change at a rate that we've never seen before. So what does all this result in? Well, we were named as a leader in the uh, the G2 grid for IT service management and service desk tools. So unlike the usual analyst reports, positioning on G2 is actually determined by feedback from people who are actually using the software. And thanks to the power of our customer advocacy, we fared pretty well in that uh, in that report. So I'll give you some of the highlights. So we didn't enter the quadrant uh, until end of July, beginning of August. And in just four weeks, we sprinted through the high performance quadrant and took our place in the, the ITSM market and, and service desk markets in a leader's position. Some of the highlights from that, we uh, not only the leader, but the highest user adoption across enterprise customers, the best support and also the easiest to use. Our net promoter score is 80, uh, over 80. So that's the highest of any leader in the quadrant. We're the number one for process workflow and ease of doing business with, ranked at 93%, likely to recommend 92%. So what I'd encourage you to do is to act now. You need to modernize your service management. And regardless of what tool you choose, remember that basically this is not about purchasing a new tool, you're investing in a relationship. So a couple of things you need to bear in mind there is that on-premise, that's dead. Your digital transformation strategy has to accelerate the replacement of those tools. First generation SaaS, it, these are powerful tools, but they need an entire ecosystem of consultants, implementation partners, trainers, just to get them up and running. Then a small army of developers and administrators to keep them in check. Six week tool upgrade projects just to fix bugs and get the latest features, that's no longer acceptable. In the new normal, we're gonna have significant cost cuts coming and we will have to deliver change, change and change again. So that approach no longer cuts it. So post COVID, IT groups will have to be self-sufficient and agile enough to improve, automate and integrate any business process across any service delivery team. So this is the area of second generation SaaS solutions and they're going to have the edge. Not because they're gonna be implemented so quickly, but because configuration and customization is a point and click exercise, no need for technical gurus. And the thing is, all customers are on the same version. So the vendor can do the heavy lifting um, with backups, resilience, security, architectural enhancements. All of that just happens and upgrades happen in the background. And your customizations continue to work. You don't have to reapply or rework them. So it's just better when things work. I did mention at the start of this that I'd share some of those uh, resources with you. And this is the path out of COVID. I'm sure the slides will be circulated so if you can't read that URL. Uh, and you can access the slides and actually watch the previous webinar. Also, what we do have to think about is uh, security investment. Because if you're here looking for new tools, that's fantastic. But bear in mind that your organization, every part of it is going to be looking for money to improve things. And your business case really needs to align to that. And it has to have clear measurable benefits in terms of efficiency, self-sufficiency, and a lightning ability to adapt to change. So I will leave you with this as uh, before we go into a demo to basically what, what does cloud native mean? What does second generation SaaS mean? Well, basically, this is a quote from one of our customers just basically saying, look, look, most of the time when vendors claim that their upgrades are seamless, typically it means you have to clone things, upgrade, test, all that type of thing. And with Hornbill, it's like updating Facebook. 
uh, basically you can click a button or in fact you can just what we have done now this is kind of out of date because customers used to click a single button 30 seconds later the upgrade is done and they actually asked us through that community say look can you remove that just perform the upgrades so upgrades just happen and you just don't have to deal with it ever again so what i'll do now is i'll pass over to abdi and stop sharing my screen so let me just get out of that uh, stop showing my screen and Abdi will give you a, a sense of um, what we're talking about in terms of configuration. Abdi. Thanks Pat. Can you guys see my, oh, can you see my screen? Okay, Pat, just to confirm. Uh, yes, I can. Yeah. Excellent. Brilliant. Okay, brilliant. Well, thanks. Thanks for that intro, Pat. And um, as I say, over the next few minutes, we're going to, I'm going to use the word canter through a few key areas that we wanted to highlight for you guys today. The first of which is going to be just talking really about that concept of ESM and the self-service and user adoption, the experience for your employees. Um, then we'll touch on uh, some aspects around business process orchestration, automation and integration, um, given the comments Pat's just made in terms of eliminating waste and trying to give your organization that competitive edge. And then we'll wrap up with some business intelligence and look at a few of the different layers of MI and business intelligence and operational dashboards that are available within the Hornbill platform. So let's start with the uh, self-service um, as we talked about there a minute ago. So I'm just logging into our employee portal um, and this is very much an ESM portal in the sense that you as an employee um, have access not only to the services available from the IT service domain but any other domain that supports you in your endeavors as an employee, whether that's the facilities team, the HR team, whether that's finance or any other particular department that might offer up services that keep you productive um, and um, provide you with access to or support and knowledge that you need to keep working effectively. Okay, so logged in here today as a user called Tom and what Tom can see on the self-service is his world according to the subscriptions that he's entitled to, the access, the visibility uh, based on teams or groups or any other logical assignments that he might belong to. So it's a subscription based view across those different service domains. It's probably worth just noting at this point that this is a codelessly configured portal. So all of the configuration can be done by um, drag and drop configuration. There's no cutting of any code. Secondly, the fact that that can be customized in terms of look and feel and color branding uh, language. Um, so again, one can log in here using one's uh, preferred language based on various settings within the system. So again, we have um, sort of bi-directional tra uh, translations available as well. So again, for anyone who's working across different geographies, that can be quite a useful feature. Down in the bottom right hand side, you can also see we, we enable the capability for chat. Um, but for today's demo, we're going to run through a couple of different scenarios here just to give you a sense of what's possible within the employee portal. So just on the homepage here, the company homepage can be configured and, and designed according to your own preferences. You can see at the top here, we have a, a federated search here um, and across the top, what this is going to do at the top level is going to search across all of the different service domains that this particular user might have access to. Uh, and in this case, perhaps looking for some help around mobile and looking for some policy documentation within the knowledge base to allow them to understand what their uh, permissions and cake and um, uh, support options are around the mobile phone service that's being provided here. So quick example there of the global search capability across the different domains, some of the popular services that might be used, notices in terms of events, bulletins, so this might be information about upcoming events, changes, issues with particular services as we can see here with the link um, issue here ex affecting external calls. Um, all the customers or end users requests and again if you're a line manager it may be that you want to be able to see requests that are logged for your own team but potentially if that's something you want to surface up as well. Kicking through some of these other domains obviously as an ESM solution there may be uh, more specific stuff that a particular domain may want to publish so in this case if we're talking about HR it would be down to the HR team to publish their services and to configure, as I say here, what they want to make available to the subscribers of their service. In this particular example, we can see some, some information in terms of a bulletin here around benefits and the new cycle to work scheme potential, um, the ability to provide 
uh, access to the key services. So again, as a line manager, Tom may want to come in here and undertake to onboard a new employee or to offboard a new employee. So this is initiating effectively a service request, uh, which has an underpinning workflow that would execute on that whole process. And we'll come back and have a look at some of that workflow, particularly the onboarding workflow in a moment when we look at some of the configuration of the business process orchestration and automation in a moment. Further to that, obviously, um, Tom could come in here and have a look at things like his benefits, again, making requests, enrolling into things that are available to him, um, additional resources that one might want to make available. So this might be um, the creation of additional pages. So again, as the administration side of things is concerned, one can create and, and add as many sort of pages as one needs in here to surface up that information. And in this particular case, this is linking off to um, so affiliate sites, if you like, in terms of things like the you know, life insurance or you know, perks and such like that might be made available to the employees. And then down at the bottom here, and again, this is just purely the way this has been laid out. We've got access to some of the key HR documentation policies um, and other paperwork that might be relevant and required from a HR perspective. So moving on to something like the IT domain, again, one of the key things that you might want to surface up on the self-service and the employee portal is things like um, metrics. And here we can see some, some simple metrics displayed very cleanly. Obviously, this is not the best metric in terms of 67% availability on the VPN, but again, really key, particularly in the given climate where we've got many people working from home, the VPN service is quite a popular service at the moment. So again, quite useful to be able to provide that information and obviously feedback in terms of the, the satisfaction of the end users in relation to the requests and the incidents that they have had raised and closed off by the support team. So again, across your different domains, you can survey your end employees and provide feedback in terms of how well each domain is performing against the service they're providing. Impacted services, so again, if something's down, we can make that and surface that up there. And more importantly, if there's any new services that we might want to bring attention to, we can start to publish that. And again, all of these are just widgets that can be displayed. One of the things that um, we've showcased recently is the ability of using the capability to configure you know, specific pages and different domains is this idea of perhaps creating a you know, specific domain relating to all the sorts of things that uh, might be important to those folks working from home given the current climate. So in this particular example, what we're surfacing up is a one-stop shop, if you like, for those folks working from home. Um, it could be that you present something similar to those folks that are just recently onboarded, um, which gives them the ability to access the stuff that they might be more likely to require as a, as a newly onboarded employee, for example. But in this example, you know, quick access to uh, phone numbers, access to um, collaboration um, on Teams if need be, the ability again to do your global searching in here, but more importantly, quick links, things like your health and safety in the home. So maybe you've just onboarded a new employee and you want to do that. Um, health and safety risk assessment in terms of their work environment. Is that safe environment? So again, we can take them through and step them through these assessments. And obviously as they go through this assessment, any feedback that comes off the back of that could through the workflow, invoke tasks or, or um, um, particular requests that might be raised in order to facilitate you know, additional equipment or any other um, uh, follow-up that's required off the back of such an assessment. Expenses policy, policy documents, things like that are important here. Troubleshooting documents, again, quick things that help the users help themselves in a working from home scenario or being able to access and request equipment. And again, all of this can be configured seamlessly to um, automate the ordering and all sorts of other things that might be required, including the delivery of software automatically onto people's devices and so forth. So again, without clicking through all of those things, um, that's all possible. The other, well, other option here is just a simple, quite um, um, uh, light way of actually accessing some help. So it might be that you just simply want to ask the, the end user to select what their problem is. And again, knowing who the user is, we can determine what we're presenting these, uh, in these uh, intelligent capture forms. Um, it could be that they've um, got an issue with their laptop, which is simply the, the, the option, or it might be that they've forgotten their password and we want to facilitate them resetting that. And again, that can be done automatically through the workflow as I'll show you in a moment. So a whole bunch of different options. Just by way of an example, um, I'm just gonna go in here and let's use the VPN again, because that was a, a popular challenge at the moment. Um, one of the things we can see from here is obviously being able to surface up um, knowledge and that knowledge could be in the form of um, uh, text or video based knowledge again in here 
or it could be that having checked out the knowledge that this user still wants to go ahead and report an issue with their VPN. So again, what we're launching here is what we um, call in as our intelligent capture built through our progressive capture. And what this allows you to do is to effectively define a capture workflow, which is um, smart enough to branch and to um, uh, drive the user through an, uh, a capture experience that allows you as a service team to get the right information first time. So in this example, we're prompting the user to try a couple of simple steps which may um, resolve the issue automatically. And again, from here, if we click yes, all sorted, that would close and log that request is resolved. Or we can step through, uh, if that's not the case, provide further uh, drive to push them towards knowledge and a video perhaps. Um, if that's still an issue, we can come back in here and we can give them the option to provide more information. And as we go, you can see our active knowledge is presenting more and more information as we go, hoping, hope, helping the customer to try and resolve the issue as we go. If that, none of that all works, then ultimately we can get to a point where we can actually have the customer or the end user log that request and that comes in to the normal challenge channels in the service desk. So the, the kind of automation orchestration piece then flips into play here because we've now captured the relevant information. Because we knew this was a VPN issue, we can automatically route that to the correct team. We already have the relevant information. We've taken those first couple of steps to try and triage the issue. So we know that um, we're into actually looking at resolving this and we can start to pick that up with the right resource and perhaps even bypass the initial first line uh, triage piece because the end user has been guided to this point by the system, okay? So in terms of self-service, that was as far as I was going to take it. Let's um, change context. And just quickly in terms of the configuration of that self-service, I've just changed users now. So I'm in as one of our service agents. And in this case, um, the user called Graham is slightly more elevated in his permissions. Um, and in this case, he has the abilities to come in to start to configure things like the self-service. So again, just to get, give you a quick idea in terms of the level of uh, ease in which one can configure this. You can see that the, the layout in particular, I'm looking at this widget here, which is just a bunch of um, items that we've bundled together here and presented. Obviously you can decide as you choose what the icons are and where they're positioned and the text that's presented. All of that's completely configurable and soft. And again, that applies across all of the different domains. Um, so again, if we go into the IT domain, we can start to configure the different widgets um, and start to present that information, make it visible, invisible as required. So from a configuration perspective, this is all designed to be self-sufficient. And as Pat talked about earlier on, what we don't need in this day and age is to have to call on an army of consultants or a you know, whole vendor ecosystem in order to make simple changes that should be easily achieved, not only by the IT team, but even down to the level where the HR team or the business team in its own right can take those changes themselves. Okay. In terms of Slightly moving the presentation forward, we're going to move on to the topic of workflow and business process orchestration and automation. Um, but just before I jump into that, what I wanted to do is just highlight the fact that all of the Hornbill system is underpinned by our service portfolio. Um, and what this gives you is the ability to define all those different services as, as uh, discussed, whether that's in the IT domain or in the finance domain or indeed in the people services or HR domain. So this is where one would articulate those different services in your portfolio. Um, and then from there, we can start to articulate underneath each one of these services, what is it that we're providing in terms of what's the service, any details that we want to capture, who's that service made available to, who are our subscribers, is it the whole organization, a particular team, department, cost center. More importantly, who are the supporting teams? So again, through here, we can start to segregate that information out. So if this was a service that pertained to the HR function, we can actually um, screen that off or segregate that information away from any of the other functions on the system. So once a supporting team is assigned to a particular service, they're the only ones that can effectively see or interact with the tickets that sit within that domain. That ensures the highest levels of security and data protection for you. OK, so in terms of your service, you know, some very simple choices to make. What is it I do? Who do I provide that service to? Who provides the support to that service? And then there's a various other choices in terms of, you know, is there any underpinning configuration items and, and assets? Is there any FAQs and notes and bulletins that we want to publish against that service? Is there an SLA that we deliver against that particular service that's specific? So all of those kind of choices are very simple to make. Uh, and easy to configure, as you can see on the screen uh, here. Underpinning the service catalog and the service portfolio, obviously, is the whole notion of our CMDB and the, the ability to surface up 
not only your CIs and um, your assets, but also the relationships. And in this case, we're looking at the CMDB from the perspective of that home working service, some of the underpinning configuration items here being the, VIP, uh, the VPN software and the, uh, in this case, the VPN gateway, um, and then a bunch of um, um, uh, CIs that are linked off the back of that. And again, we can start to define all those upstream and downstream dependencies. And as we scroll down or in or out here, we can start to bring into view things like, are there any changes logged against that particular uh, service? And we can start to explore and, and understand what the impact of those changes might be. Okay. So again, all of that underpins what we provide. Now, again, drilling down one more level in terms of defining those services, what sits behind those services are a, um, a request catalog. And within that request catalog is the ability to define the workflows that each of those request types will initiate. So in the case of that VPN request that we logged earlier on or an onboarding request, all of that's underpinned by a couple of things. One, our intelligent capture in terms of the, the, the forms that we push out. And two, once we capture that information, what do we then do in relation to how we orchestrate the, 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 the passage of that request or that um, incident through our organization um, and how we might orchestrate either human activity or machine or you know, software based uh, automated activities as well. So let's cover that real quick. So the first thing really I was going to cover is the idea of the uh, intelligent capture and that's based in our, our progressive capture. So this is where you can effectively, for want of a better word, lay out or train our forms in order to capture the right information and to step your employee through providing the right um, information so that we can get to resolving their issue as quickly as possible. So in terms of that VPN access issue that we logged a little while ago, we can see here that the actual form that we're taking through isn't necessarily a form in the traditional form. It's a set of questions with the ability for us to branch and um, step through and provide the right information. Now, this is as easy to configure as dragging out, adding in a new form, or if we wanted to embed a new something in here between there and that decision, we can start to do the same thing here. Um, so again, very simple to configure, doesn't require any um, specific coding knowledge. And again, once we're at this level, it's simply deciding whether this is a default form that we're providing and which form we want to offer, whether it's asking for an attachment, de defining which contact is being um, um, pulled into this particular ticket, which asset, what site, whatever it might be. So those are your default type questions versus these purple nodes, which is where we're providing custom questions. And again, this is as simple as just adding a new option in. What kind of question is it? Is it a single text field, a date picker, whatever it might be, um, and adding those into the into the workflow. So again, doesn't require any coding, very simple to do, visually easy to understand. And again, with a matter of a few, few minutes of training, uh, most users can come in and start to do this kind of stuff across their own domains. So the second aspect that we want to cover in terms of now orchestration and automation is once we've captured the right information, how do we then take those requests, those instances, those changes through the workflow? So I'm going to touch on two quick processes. So again, this is now stepping into our business process orchestration capability. And again, it looks fairly similar to the canvas I showed you a moment ago. But think of this, if you will, as Visio on steroids in the sense that one can come in here and lay out their specific workflow, be that something, you know, traditionally understood in, in IT, like a change workflow, or it could be something across the business where there is a form that gets filled in for whatever the purpose might be, you know, stationary purchase, whatever it might be, that then has to follow a workflow that may need some orchestration of human activity or some automation or integration into third party systems in order to facilitate the outcomes you're looking for. So in this particular example, you can see this change process. And again, the system ships with a bunch of default processes, for instance, problem change, release, um, all of those come out the box. You can take those, you can use them as they are, you can modify and configure them, or you can start with a blank canvas um, and build out your own processes. Or as Pat talked about earlier on, we have a huge community of, of customers who share this information um, and through that, they can pass these, these workflows um, to each other. So in this particular case, you can see here, we've got uh, various stages that we can take the workflow through. Um, and again, configuring and managing these processes is as simple as coming in here and deciding that perhaps I would like to do some kind of automation. Perhaps it's into a cloud system. Um, so maybe you're in your onboarding process rather than change process here. And what you're looking to do is to integrate out to something like, I don't know, Microsoft, for example, uh, in order to 
create a new user in Azure or maybe to jump onto Intune and disable or create a new device or to deploy some software. All of those capabilities are available here. If you've got development teams using things like Jira, we can pass into there or whether you've got a third party uh, supplier who's using something like ServiceNow and you want to raise a change on their instance, all of that capability is available to you within the Humble platform. So as I said, whether it's a, a change process or whether it's something like a onboarding process, we have the capability for you to come in and start to orchestrate human activities. As we see here, these gray nodes are human activities. The green and the amber nodes here are basically saying this is a parallel processing stage where between here and here, all of this stuff needs to come back together before we can move on. So here we're having human activity to create equipment, install some applications, set up email, whereas the yellow nodes here are automations um, into third party systems like Salesforce or Azure here to create user accounts uh, and the like. And again, it may be over time that you start to replace some of these human tasks with automations. In, in this case, setting up email could be replaced with um, an automated call out into Office 365 to, to generate that account. So in terms of business process or orchestration, Hornbills very capable and one of the key things I would leave you with is the fact that what you're able to do with Hornbill is to build your processes rather than have to work in a way that the system limits you based on its capabilities. So with Hornbill you're very much able to take that toolkit and build out your workflows. So just to close out very quickly, um, in terms of uh, MI and reporting, there's lots of options within Hornbill. I'm uh, just going to touch quickly on two, three things here. The first one being the ability obviously to work within your request list, but more importantly from these request lists to be able to define your own personal dashboards. Um, so each agent, each manager has the ability to define these work, these operational dashboards, which allow you to drill through uh, and see the information sitting underneath there. So if we're looking to find out what are these three requests here that are waiting assessment, we can drill back through and have a look at that. So this is very much about giving you as an agent or, an, or a manager the ability to um, um, prioritize, to, to, to drill down, to understand what sits behind what's on the screen and what needs to be uh, taken action on straight away. The second tier up then is looking at what we might coin as um, analytics here in terms of um, direct analytics. This doesn't require any sort of SQL or database knowledge. This is purely driven through uh, click and configure capabilities. And it might be that as a manager, you're looking to look, look for, you know, any requests sat with different members of your team that have overdue tasks, or as an example, being able to come through and look at, um, you know, a simple metric like where are our requests coming from? You know, we might have got an objective to move our requests through to self-service so we can see what percent of our requests are coming through on the self-service channel. We obviously have the capability for things like boards. I think um, this is a fantastic option, particularly for seeing sort of real time where, is, where are our tickets about to breach or more importantly, where are our changes sitting today right now, a live view of, of that. And then last but not least, if we start looking into sort of the MI side of things, we can start to look at things like our advanced analytics where we can start to build out things like measures. So this is being able to trend and snapshot data into the database which ultimately allows us to build widgets and dashboards, the culmination of which is to be able to build out what we call uh, a slideshow. Um, and this could be the ability to present out, you know, a large scale dashboard wallboard like this that can um, sit up on a large screen somewhere in the, in the organization or give direct access to something like this to your uh, management execs, etc. Okay. And lastly, to close out, I'm conscious of time, we have the options for uh, exporting or tapping into the Hornbill database and information into things like Power BI. As you can see here, this is a, a Power BI driven dashboard based on the Hornbill data. So with that, I'm going to stop and hand back to uh, David and Pat. Thank you, Abdi. Um, that's that's great. Some really good stuff there. Certainly, again, on self-sufficiency, that, that thing about acting now, the no-code configuration, the agility, um, and sort of that on-premise is dead, which is really cool. Also more BSM focus and the home worker. And, and certainly congratulations guys on the G2 success, that's great. Now we've run over a little bit there. So um, what I'm gonna do is, is take some of the questions that we've got and, and put them in the panel for a little bit later guys, if that's okay. So thank you very much indeed for, um, for that, that comprehensive overview look. Um, and we'll speak to you hopefully in the panel um, a little bit later. Thanks David. Excellent, thank you guys. Okay, so we're going to end this broadcast here and we're going to